Welcome, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us uh, for our discussion of philosophy and the pandemic, reasoning in unreasonable times. Um, COVID-19 has certainly brought about some fundamental philosophical questions and, and brought them into sharp focus, including such things as the role and rhetoric of expertise, states of exception, trust, goodwill, these kinds of questions. We're going to be looking at them today with a, a panel of four colleagues in philosophy. My name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute at NUI Galway. And this is the ninth in our COVID-19 response uh, series seminar, uh, a series of seminars. Recordings of previous discussions are available through the Moore Institute website on our YouTube channel. And I'm grateful to David Kelly for hosting the session and sorting out our technical needs behind the scene and indeed for ensuring that the videos are posted on our site. I will now introduce the speakers in the order in which they will appear. Nick Tosh uh, teaches logic, critical thinking, and data science at NUI Galway in the School of History and Philosophy. His research interests include the interpretation of probability and the history and philosophy of cognitive science. Before joining NUI Galway in 2008, he was a junior research fellow in history and philosophy of science at Trinity College, Cambridge. Heike Feltzman is a lecturer in applied ethics uh, in the discipline of philosophy at NUI Galway. Her philosophical interests are in the area of bioethics, especially information technology ethics, healthcare ethics, and ethical governance. She has extensive experience with working as an ethicist across disciplines. Her work pays particular attention to relational and governance issues in ethics. Lucy Elvis is a part-time lecturer in the discipline of philosophy and a staff member in the School of Philosophy and History. Her interests include aesthetics and the philosophy of art. She's one of the founders and co coordinators of NUI Galway Philosophy's Philosophical Dialogue Project, which focuses on bringing philosophy into Galway City primary schools and creating communities of philosophical inquiry on campus. She's also the current chairperson of the Board of Trustees of Tulka, Festival of Visual Art, and a founder of Curo, Thinking for Communities, a not-for-profit organization which brings philosophy outside the institution through after school clubs and camps, as well as partnerships with libraries, festivals, and arts organizations. Felix Omuruku is professor of philosophy at NUI Galway, and he's the former head of the School of Humanities. Uh, he's a former Fulbright scholar and has published articles, papers, and, and chapters in, in uh, the area of phenomenology, particularly on Heidegger, Husserl, Merleau Ponty, Levinas, and Marion, with an emphasis on questions of religion, time, violence, and the self. He is the author of three monographs and the editor of one collection, including the, the book, The Time of Revolution, Kairos and Kronos in Heidegger, which came out in 2013, and A Phenomenology of Christian Life, Glory and Night, which also came out in 2013. We're broadcasting today, both through Zoom and on our Facebook page live. So Nick, can I ask you to begin? Yes, thank you, Dan, um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I should just say at the start that if you guys hear any strange squawking noises, that's, that's not me, that's the family of jackdaws in my chimney just off camera. Um, they're quiet currently, but they make a hell of a racket at times, so uh, that, that might interrupt me. Um, I want to just say a bit about the, the role of scientific experts in, in, the, in the current COVID crisis. Um, particularly scientific experts advising governments. And I think it goes without saying that we, we need those experts, that it would be very bad if, um, if public trust in them were to collapse. And that could happen if the experts screw up badly enough, and there's not much that we as non-experts can do about that. But it could also happen if the experts don't screw up. And in fact, I think that with a sufficiently dysfunctional public sphere, it could happen as a result of the experts doing their jobs well. And I want to just talk a bit about that here. So one problem is that the virus is new. We, um, we started off not knowing much about it at all, and now we're learning a bit more each week. So if the experts are doing their jobs well, the expert consensus is going to shift from time to time because it is responsive to the evidence. The reasons for the, the shifts will sometimes be um, hard to explain to the public simply because cutting edge science is, um, tends to 
messy and complicated, but it will always be easy for journalists to run some version of those stupid scientists can't keep their story straight if they want to. Um, I think we've seen some signs of that happening in response to the shifting consensus around the danger of outside infection, for example. To turn to a second problem, um, it's often the case that scientific advisors to governments are asked to make conditional predictions. What would happen if we did nothing, or if we did X, or if we did Y? Now, even if the advisors were kind of magic oracles who got all these conditional predictions completely right, they'd still be vulnerable, I think, to being slimed. All the slimer has to do is ignore the distinction between conditional predictions and unconditional predictions. Um, so for example, the Imperial College team is, um, is still getting flack for its prediction or its prediction of 500,000 COVID deaths in the UK. But that was their prediction for what would happen if no action was taken to help mitigate the epidemic. And of course, action was taken. Um, not enough, it turns out, but certainly not nothing. And the team certainly was not predicting half a million deaths in the context involved and um, attempted lockdown. A third type of problem arises when the evidence seems to suggest that there is a, a small but still significant chance of some catastrophically bad outcome and expert advisors draw attention to that fact. Um, so for example, we can imagine a scenario in which the experts judge that there is, say, um, a 10% chance of a massive second wave of COVID cases this winter, perhaps five times bigger than the first wave. Now, if the government trusts that judgment, then there are all sorts of costly things they should be doing now, just in case that massive second wave arrives. Now, if we suppose once again, and this is just for the sake of argument, of course, that the experts are magic oracles whose judgment is absolutely spot on, um, we can ask what is going to happen come winter? And most likely the answer is no massive second wave. After all, the chance was only 10%. That's what the experts said and they're magic oracles, so that's the correct chance. And 10% outcomes tend not to occur. And yet when that massive second wave doesn't arrive, there are gonna be plenty of people who are blaming the experts for their stupid prediction and for all the resources that the government wasted because they stupidly trusted that prediction. So those are just three ways um, in which I think expert advisors could find themselves getting unfairly slimed in this crisis. Um, changing their advice when the evidence changes is the first route. Um, the second route was that they might make correct conditional predictions that get misrepresented as incorrect unconditional predictions. Um, and the third route was they might quite properly draw attention to tail risks, which turn out, as expected, not to materialize. So none of those sliming channels are COVID specific quite, um, but I do think that they're all pretty strongly COVID enhanced. Um, because we're in such a quickly changing situation, we have a case where the evidence base is changing unusually quickly. So it's gonna be, um, happening more often than usual, the expert consensus is shifting from month to month. Um, we're also in a situation in which governments around the world are desperately trying to make policy on the hoof, possibly more desperately and more on the hoof in some countries, but nonetheless. Um, and in that situation, governments are gonna need lots of conditional predictions to help support their brainstorming. Um, and, and if the experts are asked to make lots of conditional predictions, then, then the opportunity for unscrupulous or incautious journalists to slime them for them um, is going to be proportionately greater. Uh, and of course, there are plenty of tail risks to be concerned about in a scenario like this, both because the possible bad outcomes are very severe and also because the uncertainty is so high. So those three sliming channels seem to be um, particularly threatening in the present climate. Um, 
And finally, it's worth noting that the political stakes are so high that there is serious danger of governments taking advantage of, um, of some or all of those channels to slide their own experts. So I think it really is important for us to be alert to these possibilities. Of course, experts can screw up and of course, some experts will screw up over the course of this crisis. Um, but if we see them getting attacked in the media or, or, um, or by government ministers or government spokespeople, we do, I think, need to think very hard about whether that criticism is warranted, particularly if the experts are being criticised for making bad predictions. Um, the detailed structure of those predictions matters a great deal, um, and vague summaries can be extremely misleading. I think that's about all I have to say. Thank you, Nick. Very interesting. Yeah, <clears throat> a number of questions we can come back to there. And just one thing quickly that occurs to me is, I think generally there's a feeling, maybe even a relief um, amongst uh, academics, for example, people in our kind of community that expertise, the stock of experts has gone up, having been under threat in the kind of Trump moment and, and Michael Gove and so forth. At the same time, I think you're sounding an interesting cautionary note like that, that tide could move in another direction depending upon circumstances. So that, that's actually very interesting. Lots to come back to, as I say. Uh, so Heike, I think uh, we're, we're gonna hear from you next. So I invite you to speak. Okay. Yeah, um, so I'll follow on from Nick, um, who looked at what does it mean to make predictions as an expert and how can misunderstanding what um, probabilities, for example, mean uh, in, in the expert context, how could that lead to distrust? So what I want to look at then is um, taking a little bit, bit more general perspective on trust in this particular COVID situation. So what does it take to trust in experts or the government more generally? And um, yeah, so what I'd like to outline there is philosophically speaking, there have been, uh, there's been quite a bit of attention given to trust in the last 15 years or so, which um, wasn't a topic at all in the kind of wider uh, sense, in at least not in the ethics debate. And um, yes, so I think having a look at what philosophy uh, and the analysis of the concepts of trust and trustworthiness might contribute to structuring our understanding of what happens when trust is lost or established um, yeah, is what, what I'd like to look at. So um, yeah, maybe just to mention some authors, uh, just for those who haven't come across them before, um, Honora O'Neill is probably uh, one of the ones with the most public um, appeal and, um, and awareness who has done a lot of work on trust in bioethics. Annette Bayer and um, Nancy Potter would be um, other authors also looking at that particular theme. So they're all women philosophers. We may or may not want to give that um, some importance. And um, they could all be identified as maybe to some extent feminist, but in very different ways. And um, yeah, so what they have in common is that their interest and trust really arose from their conviction that the focus on ensuring informational transparency, on understanding what is going on, and maybe thinking logically having information, um, that that is not all that is needed for um, in decision making. So, for example, Honora Neal started looking at informed consent in medicine and the focus on um, always just looking at what information needs to be given to people in order for them then to be able to make the right decisions. And what she said, really what seems to be happening in many of these situations also in regard to contracts or government accountability, that just having information available and being transparent about information is not sufficient and that we really need to pay attention to the wider relational, effective or structural conditions within which such decisions are being made. So that might matter potentially more because what they do, um, what those factors impact is, um, yeah, the position of the parties affected by these uh, decisions towards each other. And that 
that might be more important than just looking at what, um, what information is being exchanged or how information is being understood. So when we're looking at trust and trustworthiness, what that means is we need to pay attention to these wider structural, potentially effective um, aspects as well, and not just on the really important parts of understanding, say, the logic and the information as uh, Nick was highlighting there. So looking at how trust is being understood, um, I'm just going to go through some elements of a definition there um, that we can um, derive from, from the writings of these authors that I mentioned before, O'Neill, uh, Bayer, and, um, and Potter. Um, yeah, so the first is where well, trust is an attitude of optimism. It's an attitude of optimism towards others that assumes their goodwill. And distrust tends to arise from a doubt in whether these others deserve this optimism, either due to a lack of competence or lack of goodwill, or potentially both. And if we want to think about trust in governance during COVID times, we may find examples of all of these. <laughs> yeah, so the attitude of optimism is one part. Then the next one is we do, in a trust situation, we rely on others or count on them. Um, and we may do so by choice or by necessity. So if we look at our current situation where we have little choice <laughs> regarding our dependence on government decisions, um, but we may either rely grudgingly or wholeheartedly, depending on how reliable we actually consider them. And then a really important element of trust is trust becomes relevant in the face of uncertainty. And that's, again, that links in with what, what Nick was saying as well, that you know, dealing with uncertainty already comes with a lot of cognitive challenges because we're not very well built to deal with probability in our thinking. But yeah, so that, that's, those are situations where also the, the question of trust then comes in. If we're not entirely sure um, how, a how to understand information, how to interpret it, but also if we're not entirely sure what is actually going to happen, um, trust becomes more important in these situations. So what we can look at here is on the one hand, personal uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty. So as citizens, we just don't have sufficient knowledge. We're not epidemiologists. We don't know enough about the virus. Even the experts, and that was one of the challenges obviously, uh, did not have much certainty uh, at the beginning and are only developing that certainty um, as, as we go along. And then we have the wider societal or epidemiological uncertainty as well. So even experts can't predict how events will develop because there's so many different parameters. And um, yeah, so we know there's uncertainty and um, that means trust has to fill the gap to a certain extent. And then Trust usually is also uh, becomes relevant when we have situations of harm, so of a risk of harm. And um, we're trying to protect ourselves and our communities from harm, which in COVID situation includes health as well as other harms, for example, the economic harms. And we're balancing different values. And that is something that you find very prominently in the public debate in which trust is appealed to or in which distrust is being fostered by highlighting how well maybe certain harms are not being paid attention to by um, by governments by decision makers by let's say health experts who may not see the economic harms etc yeah so that's where does trust come into the picture the closely associated concept here would be trustworthiness so not everyone who's trusted is actually trustworthy. So when we look at government's responses, we, um, we might perhaps look at some that set of philosophical criteria for trustworthiness that could highlight some aspects um, that help us to look at what are the perceived failings or successes of government responses. And so, yeah, just looking at some criteria or um, parameters uh, regarding trustworthiness. So on the one hand, trustworthiness is very closely linked to competence. So we consider people trustworthy when they have the competence to perform what the agent is trusted with. And so when we look at government's varying responses regarding stockpiles or testing or contact tracing or um, determining what the overarching goals of their policy should be, 
we can identify different levels of competence, different levels of success in achieving those goals and, um, and having a clear plan on realizing them. Reliability. It's closely linked to competence. It's not entirely the same. So reliability of performance um, of what the agent is trusted with is also important. So um, can we see a policy working um, uh, over time in a reliable way? And um, changes in perception over time of certain um, approaches, for example, are something that is uh, being discussed in Sweden, for example, where at the beginning we had a very high trust um, uh, attitude towards this approach, towards um, herd immunity in the Swedish context, when now, when the data doesn't look um, as successful anymore, there's potentially things changing. This is closely linked as well to the idea of, um, of trustworthiness as um, dispositional, as something that allows us to be adaptive, so that um, a trustworthy agent potentially is able to change what they do uh, in trying to achieve the so responding adequately to changing circumstances, responding to changes in evidence. Again, as Nick was um, highlighting, that something that may look like a, uh, like a change in uh, opinion can be extraordinarily justified through having um, just responding adequately to the evidence. The internal coherence of what the agent is trusted with is another thing. So, um, for example, if you look at, say, the UK approach to that started with um, a look at uh, attempting herd immunity, while at the same time um, uh, conveying the strong appreciation of the NHS, is that actually internally coherent? So, is an agent trustworthy that tries to highlight two of these things that seem to stand in quite, um, quite significant conflict with each other? Another aspect of trustworthiness is usually that um, the interpersonal or the relational element, so the um, display of an interest in the establishment and maintenance of a positive relationship. So the importance of actually communicating as a government or as uh, experts, communicate um, and uh, yeah, uh, caring or empathy or understanding of what people are actually going through so that um, that there's a connection between those who make the decisions and those who actually experience the um, results of these decisions. And where something like that element is crystallized, for example, where the, the media discussions regarding the US about the contrast between Trump's versus Cuomo's uh, communications, where what was highlighted so much was the, the importance of having a sense that somebody understands and cares and can relate to the fears that people are actually um, experiencing. Yeah, and then the ethical conceptualization of the agents' responsibilities towards those who are trusting is another element that um, is often discussed in relation to trustworthiness. So because as a decision maker, um, you are being entrusted with the well-being of the agent, uh, of, of the others. So they're dependent on you and because of this, power relationship or this dependency, a sense of appreciation of the impact and significance of the decisions that are being made and the you know, moral responsibilities towards the affected citizens is really important. If we think about, again, COVID discourse, um, about the examples where it was being said, well, it's only the old and disabled who are affected, nobody else needs to worry. That is clearly <laughs> missing a recognition of the significance of the moral responsibilities we have towards all citizens, including and especially the old and disabled. And then the last element um, that I want to uh, highlight and then I'll finish is the issue of accountability towards those who are trusting. So are those who are making decisions, are they drawing the decisions, are they drawing on evidence, are agents in the end held accountable or do they decide to take no responsibility at all. And um, so those different elements put together have, yeah, give us a sense of what it is that potentially um, makes us think that governments making decisions in this particular situation can be considered trustworthy or what are the parts that we, yeah, that we start being doubtful about the, their trustworthiness.
Thank you, Heike. Yeah, I was thinking of all sorts of interesting examples as you were speaking, and no doubt we'll, we'll, we'll come back to them. Um, Lucy, I wonder if I could turn to you now uh, and uh, get your, your thoughts on philosophy and the pandemic. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I, I'm kind of a different style of philosopher to Heike, um, more similar to, to Felix, perhaps. Uh, so to link in with what she's saying, um, I'm focusing here on the concept of nostalgia. Uh, and in kind of academic discourse around nostalgia, it's a concept that's um, moved from being used in a kind of descriptive sense uh, when it was originally coined by Johannes Hoffer in uh, 1890 to being something that's presupposed to have an evaluative uh, content as something somewhat negative, something to be distrusted uh, when we see it in the public sphere. And there are a couple of reasons why I think nostalgia is important or prudent to think about um, in, in the current crisis. One is the kind of nostalgia for the recent past that we see in people's conversations, this longing to get back to normal. And Honor O'Neill, uh, who Heike cited, uh, recently said in, in uh, the Irish Times that nostalgia is in fact an inappropriate response to a pandemic situation because it can inherently cloud our clear-sighted judgment uh, of that recent past to which we might be returning. We've also seen public figures uh, invoking nostalgic terms um, in order to uh, garner collective goodwill uh, around adhering to the lockdown. Uh, I'm going to choose a couple of examples from, from the UK, uh, as that's where I'm from, so I've been closely following uh, the news there. First of all, in Boris Johnson's addresses when he announced the UK-wide lockdown, there was a real Churchillian uh, kind of flavour to his public address, this notion that they were battling against this collective unseen enemy and that it was going to need a wartime resolve, this kind of recourse to a blitz spirit from the British people. This was echoed by the Queen again then on April the 5th when she cited Vera Lynn's uh, famous anthem, We'll Meet Again, uh, to try to encourage a kind of hope or optimism. Uh, and this notion of the blitz spirit being used and aestheticized especially is something that's been really carefully uh, explored in a, in, a local, in a local sense in Galway in the, in the previous edition of Tolka Festival. So Syntonic State, the festival that was curated in 2018 by Linda Shevlin, really looked at this notion of nostalgia for the recent past uh, and what it might tell us about where we're moving in the future. And I think that's the kind of notion of nostalgia that I'm perhaps going to try to speak for today um, through a kind of exploration of why it is that we, we seem to mistrust it as something that's inherently uh, inaccurate. So as part of that festival, Owen Hathaway uh, did a Q&A on campus at NUIG with Declan Long based on his book, The Ministry of Nostalgia. Uh, and his book is very interesting and um, kind of cornucopia of popular cultural references and ways in which a kind of mid-century aesthetic has been appealed to in austerity Britain. And I think this is important to think about because uh, forecasts are telling us we're heading into yet another economic crisis. Uh, so for, for Hathaway, this kind of uh, appeal to the aesthetics, but not the politics of uh, the British mid-century kind of fetishization of uh, council housing, brutalist architecture, and the now all, all but ubiquitous keep calm and carry on that's been infinitely memed uh, on the internet and reproduced um, on different pieces of homeware, tea towels, etc. Uh, is a way in which we can see this kind of nostalgic aesthetic helping us to collectively misremember the past. The slogan itself, interestingly, although coined in 1939 and put together in that famous Gil Sands text on the red background with the small crown, was never really used as an official piece uh, of propaganda. And instead, it becomes a part of the austerity nostalgia aesthetic of the British government between 2008 and 2015. What Douglas Cooper calls a kind of legislated nostalgia. Uh, that helps us to, to kind of collectively misremember. So of course we should be kind of suspicious of nostalgia when we see it in this way and Merleau-Ponty acknowledges, uh, as does Ben Highmore in his text on cultural memory, that nostalgia helps us to remember the past as it never really was. However, there's a sense in which um, we shouldn't just jump the gun and assume that nostalgia is inherently a counterproductive or, or not useful, not least of which as philosophers. Uh, Navalis tells us that philosophy itself is a form of homesickness, a need to return home, which is the original meaning 
of nostalgia when it's used descriptively as a diagnosis for um, Swiss mercenaries who are longing to return to their homeland. Uh, so if we acknowledge nostalgia uh, as something that is in fact an unresolved feeling of longing that cannot be assuaged, and interestingly Hoffer recounts the tale of um, a Swiss servant in Paris who at the very confirmation that he can return home from his master no longer wishes to do so. If we accept nostalgia as something uh, that is in fact a longing to a, for a home that we cannot return to but in fact is an opening of a, of a space of questioning perhaps between where we are now and our imagined home or an imagined originary that we would like to return to it can perhaps be thought of uh, as a kind of longing that might show us a better a future or a way of asking critically about where we go from here rather than being something that we dismiss as excessively sentimental. And I think that's everything uh, that I have just now uh, because I don't want to encroach on, on Felix's uh, talk about concepts too but I guess I just round off by saying when we look at the history of nostalgia as that nostos and algos we see that in the discourse around it we focus mostly on uh, its relationship to the past, a kind of looking backward. But in fact, it's, it has both a temporal and a spatial quality. And when those two elements are brought together, we can see nostalgia as a concept that may usefully and productively bring out a tension between the familiar and the unfamiliar in perhaps that Heideggerian or Gadamerian sense that is constitutive of being and therefore constitutive of who we are. Thank you very much, Lucy. Extremely interesting. Um, I, we have to note that it is now the late Vera Lynn. Vera Lynn has passed away, and so therefore, uh, possibly new, new avenues of nostalgia will be drawn upon in relation to her passing. She, I think, had another top forty hit during the crisis, so she she's finished on a high note. <laughs> She'll forgive that awful pun. Felix, that's a terrible transition, and I apologize to you for. Uh, <laughs> doing that but over to you now for your, your thoughts. Thanks Dan and thanks for organizing this. Um, okay I, I want today to talk about um, four words um, how they're used, the context of their use, how that context changes, how their use can shift from descriptive to declarative or in Austin's terms constitutive to performative and how words, the use of words can bring things about and the, uh, the political dangers inherent therein. So there's four words I want to look at uh, that I think have been you know, articulated around uh, the COVID crisis, emergency, war, contagion, and herd. So I can start with emergency. Um, in the run up to the last election, including in Doyle debates, leading members of political parties spoke of a housing emergency. And then during the election campaign, said that the constitution prevented them from, from employing radical measures to uh, cope with the said emergency. With COVID, we have declared emergency. And while our constitution, because of that, our constitutional right to free movement was suspended so we couldn't drive more than two kilometers uh, without acceptable reason. What we see here is a, is a shift um, from the uh, former use of the word, which was vaguely uh, descriptive, I would be tempted to say rhetorical in the bad sense of the word, uh, to a latter use which was declarative, a declaring of emergency. And this is why the WHO hesitated to declare a pandemic, because it realized that the use of such words by authorities, particularly by, foreign gov by, sorry, by sovereign governments, uh, bring things about are uh, performative. Now, what I want to uh, refer to here particularly is the work of an Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben, uh, his uh, work on the state of exception. Um, and what Agamben points out is the state of exception or the state of emergency. That he points out that within the context of the French Revolution, the notion arose of a political state of siege. What that meant was that the government could decide that the state was under threat, right? So it wasn't that there was literally armies at the gate, but the, the government could, so to speak, by an act of, of, of will, say, you know, we are now 
in a state of siege, including, and that's important, uh, internal sedition, uh, that this was also uh, something that would provoke such, a, such an act, uh, and then bring about that government, that sovereign government could bring about emergency measures and legislation. And the occasion for such decisions widened in time, widening in its wake the power of the executive over the legislature. And we see this particularly in the, 1920, in the 1920s, following the World War I, with the economic crises that littered that, that, that decade, ending, of course, in uh, the Wall Street crash. And the Weimar Republic here is, I think, a, a salient um, example um, and, a, and, and, a, and a warning, because the Weimar Republic made use of its the clause in its constitution um, suspending fundamental rights 250 times, 250 times in its 14 year history. Such that the Reichstag had ceased to function as a, as a legislature, had effectively ceased to function as a legislature some years before the rise of Hitler in 1933. We can look at Guantanamo Bay, again, um, uh, that um, Judah Butler speaks about this as does Agamben, uh, the detention center is in effect a place of exception. Uh, it is a place where co no constitutional rights apply. Um, this center has, is, is, still, uh, is still in, in use. Um, what this shows us is the way in which liberal democracies can undermine themselves through the use of emergency measures. Um, and uh, these, precisely these emergency measures are in place today. It isn't to say that emergency measures are not justified, uh, but it is to say that there's an inherent uh, danger in them, particularly when the context of their use becomes widened. And that leads me to the notion of war. As the scope of emergency legislation grew in the uh, in, in, the, in the 20th century, so did the scope of the word war. Wars, generally, were understood as large-scale military conflicts between states. But since the 1960s, a more poetic sense of construction of war on uh, has become part of our political prose. Uh, witness the various wars on. Our war on poverty from 1964, war on drugs from 1971, war on terror from 2001, and now the war on COVID, what uh, President Macron referred to as an invisible, elusive enemy. Now, although strictly speaking, these leaders have not declared war in the sense in which war is traditionally declared, uh, they um, these were quasi declarations, which allowed uh, these leaders, uh, through emotional appeals, to mobilize public opinion uh, to support emergency measures or emergency type measures. The Patriot Act in America is a case in point. And what's particularly uh, troubling about these wars is that there is no foreseeable end for them. The war on drugs will presumably last as long as people take drugs. The war on terror, uh, presumably as long as people feel terror. And while COVID will hopefully be overcome within the next year or so, other pandemics may be around the corner and so may other crises uh, in the years to come. Third uh, word, contagion. From the Latin, contangere, uh, to touch with or together with. Contagion is something which is invisible to the, into the naked eye, which makes contact potentially dangerous and indeed potentially fatal. Generally, contagious is thought of as coming from over there, that which comes from somewhere foreign, through ports and cross borders. Hence, when Trump spoke of a foreign virus, uh, he was expressing uh, this um, quite normal, or not normal is the wrong word, but quite common um, um, sense of what a contagion is. 
So with the notion of contagion, uh, when it enters the public space, comes a sense of threat from foreigners, threat from those over there. And when the virus enters the community, then the enemy becomes perceived within and witness the, the way in which ethnic minorities have been associated with the virus in uh, various countries. On a more basic level, um, it sets up distance between people. Ironically, just weeks before the lockdown, President Higgins was speaking of the importance of touch. Um, now we cannot touch one another. The wider sense of this, I think, is touch in the sense of solidarity, of standing together, whether the De Debenhams uh, 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 workers or the Black Lives Matter protesters, touching uh, in the sense of uh, coming together um, in uh, public action uh, is constitutive of the public space. Just as a, 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 as a, as a little uh, a kind of aside here, uh, Spinoza, uh, the, the um, philosopher uh, of the 17th century, uh, was excommunicated by the orthodox, his orthodox uh, uh, Jewish community. Uh, and part of that excommunication said, no one was to stay under the same roof or come within four L's, roughly 2.7 meters of him. Right. Um, so the, 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 the very, um, probably the social distancing we're talking about is something which is, is by its very nature, uh, a way of excommunication, of breaking down uh, pub, uh, public space. And again, not to, to make any, any statement about whether this is justified or not, simply to, 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 to show the way in which once we, once this medically justified notion of contagion comes into the public space, it, it tends to um, expand its meaning and expand its uh, connotations. Lastly, herd. Uh, herd immunity is a perfectly respectable medical phrase, but medical me medicine, like most specializations, needs to abstract and bracket its object in order to investigate it. The human person as free, political, valuing, communal being is not of concern when it comes to epidemiology or, uh, or immune, immunology, uh, but rather the human being as a biological being, living in close proximity with others in a herd. And we speak also of herd instinct. Indeed, Nietzsche spoke of this and of herd mentality, but there's something deeply negative here. A herd acts as one, is infected by emotions, its members lose individuality. A herd is also herded, contained, monitored, trafficked, in certain cases slaughtered. It is not by accident that dehumanizing strategies often involve herding people into pens, cattle trucks, camps, containers. There's a danger here once we uh, move this term out of its um, domain, its proper domain within, within medicine into public discourse. Uh, that we begin to think of ourselves either individually or communally as herds. So, so to sum up, I mean, what I, what I want to, to point here is the, the dangerous slippage uh, that I think happens in the use of language um, in the way in which words move from one discourse to another, in the way words move from their descriptive to their declarative sense, uh, in particular in a context of crisis and when power responds to crisis. And as we look towards uh, the, the, 20, the this decade that we've just entered into, um, it um, may very well uh, prove to be a decade of crises, whether they be economic, political, cultural, ecological, um, and um, in the way in which uh, we use language, the words in which we use, and the, word, the way words are mobilized within this context is something I think we need to be very vigilant about. Okay, thanks uh, everybody, thank you very much. Okay. For some reason I'm unable to start my video. I don't know if David could you know, help me out there, but uh, start my video.
Hey, hurrah, that worked. And if you all could um, restart your videos too, we'll kind of uh, reconvene in, in our sort of proper panel fashion. That was extremely interesting. Um, actually, Felix, just to pick up on your, your uh, one aspect of your talk there, I, I was thinking and have been from time to time about the, the foot and mouth outbreak. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're, you're talking about a herd, herd mm -hmm. situation and we have the destruction, certainly in the UK, of the national herd. And so infectious disease, how it plays into all of the totality of, of animal life then is dealt with in some horrendous and ruthless fashion. So that, that was quite suggestive in a, in, a, in a disturbing way for me. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I want to turn to various questions and of course, by all means, you know, come in and, and comment on one. I'll direct them to particular people, but you know, everybody might want to uh, take on that. So kind of going back to, uh, to Nick, where we started, um, I've been struck by Part of the rhetorical function of statistics and graphs and charts of various different kinds throughout the crisis, it's probably been most striking in the daily uh, uh, UK briefings uh, there from Downing Street. But I just wondered if you could say something about, about the nature of, of, of what these are meant to contribute to our thinking um, and how our, our relationship to statistics has kind of changed during the, during the crisis. Gosh, that's a very, very interesting, very broad question. I'm not sure there's a good, succinct answer to it. If there is, I'm not sure I know what it is. Uh, I guess the one obvious point to make is that it's very difficult to, to quickly extract a useful lesson from a, a big table of numbers, whereas a, a, a graph takes advantage of the processing that our retina does unconsciously and lets us extract patterns quickly. So that's a, a general answer for why plots are useful visualizations. Um, in, in terms of the particular characteristics of the use of plots in the COVID crisis, um, I do worry a bit sometimes that not enough context is provided for the plots that are displayed at, at Downing Street events, and I guess similar events are elsewhere, that sometimes they might be used as a, a kind of prop to reassure people that sciencey things are happening um, mm. without being used to genuinely support advice or policy. Um, but I can't really support that hunch with particular examples. Um, that does seem like a reasonable way of looking at it, I must say. And it's, it's interesting because they, they clearly do serve a rhetorical function in one way, partly and the frequency with which they've been presented to the public is, is suggestive of that. There must be different political cultures that have been drawn to them in different ways kind of come back to that point about expertise that we started off with as well uh, in terms of how you emphasize it by having access to information. One of the discoveries has been that statistics are a representation. They are not a thing in themselves. I guess that's part of it. And I wondered, Felix, whether you, um, is there a kind of metaphorical element to it? I mean, there, there at least was one point of connection because Johnson would riff off of these metaphorically. The sombrero is, a rather jokey metaphor based on a graph. And then his Alpine imagery was, again, a similar sort of thing. So are, are those tables, are they, do they function in the way that metaphors do? Are they, a form, are they kind of language rather than, than, than numerical sorts of things, if there's a distinction? Yeah. Well, well, certainly, I mean, I mean, the visualization in and of itself kind of is an attempt, I guess, to chart uh, um, uh, to, to chart a horizon, right? I mean, so, so I mean, in terms of uh, these, um, the, the, the function of these um, broadcasts is to, uh, is to give people reassurance, but also to try to encourage them to act in certain ways, right? And, um, and I mean, I think, like, I was struck um, in the, you know, when we talked about, uh, it was back at the very beginning, um, with um, Houlihan was asked to put his finger on where we were in the curve, right? And he put it right at the bottom, right? And so again, you had that sense of, well, this is a mountain that's going to be climbed, you know, but we're going to get to the other side of it, you know, there's a horizon that we're going to reach. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, um, the, 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 there are metaphors and there are visual plays going on here. 
um, in terms of, um, and, and just the way in which, I mean, I think one of the problems here is that you've got, a, you've, you, you've got two kind of discourses coming into play. You've got the, the expert discourse on the one hand and the political discourse. And it's the attempt to translate between one and the other uh, which has proved very interesting through this whole debate, I think. Like right at the very beginning, especially in Ireland, but not just in Ireland, the, the politicians were saying, we're not making the decisions. Like, we've got nothing to do with the decisions, you know. <laughs> so it's medics, you know. <laughs> so like, you know, well, you know, and, and, and now gradually, you know, the, the, the politicians are beginning to take, to take credit for, 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 for success, right? So, so there's a, 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 I think, you know, all of this is part of a kind of a, of a hedging of bets as well. And, 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 and a way in which the, those in power are seeking to make sure that they, that they benefit and don't, don't get blamed, and, and, but at the same time manage to control the situation. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And that, that was, I guess, part of what Nick was saying too about this can shift and suddenly mm -hmm. they, they might be the fall, you know, people taking the fall. Mm -hmm. I was just too, too in a connection with what you were saying there with Lucy, your point about spatialization. You were talking about mm -hmm. it in nostalgia, but it's also true when you ask somebody to point <laughs> where are we on the curve is inviting us to a spatial imagination, which is, it's sort of, it's an interesting thing to do in itself. Like these highly imaginary things, which then have a, have a sudden immediacy and grip is mm -hmm. rather interesting. Yeah. I don't know if you have any comment on that, uh, Lucy. Um, well, it's, it's funny because it seems as though, the more prevalent cyberspace has become, the more the actual spatial is being squeezed out of discourses in, in lots of different places. So mm. I think nostalgia is not a unique concept in that sense. Our ideas about place are constantly being ebbed away. And I think you know, Edward Casey and, and Jeff Malpas are philosophers who've written really fruitfully on a need to return uh, to the notion of space and, and understanding space, not least because uh, issues of spatial ownership are very interesting at the moment. Uh, in places like the city where we see a lot of nostalgia to return to almost uh, photographs of cityscapes at the moment seem to be haunted because they're empty they're devoid of people inhabiting them mm. uh, and our nostalgic look back to those makes us believe that they were in fact ours in the first place when we know that most public spaces in fact are no longer public spaces at all and highly privatized uh, so mm. maybe a turn a return that's more critical to looking at spatiality um, could give us a real fruitful discourse about how we move forward together out of this particular crisis to a more healthy public sphere. That's very interesting. Yeah, there have been some some reflections on that reconfiguration of the relationship between public and private, but it's also about the nature of public space, um, which which has contracted obviously in a massive way. There's a question, Lucy, for you that's come in. Uh, directly that I wanted to acknowledge. I'm just going to scroll to make sure I can get to it. This is from Cleana, our, our colleague, Cleana Murray. Uh, she says, really interesting ideas, Lucy. Could you speak to the current tensions between the race protests and the nostalgia for the imagined national cohesion of the past? So that takes us in a different direction. It's not related, but uh, I wondered if you had a, a reflection on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a fabulous question. It kind of speaks to the way that we define the concept. Um, so Jeff Malpas has talked about uh, nostalgia in a kind of critical response to Svetlana Boehm's split of nostalgia into restorative nostalgia, so that nostalgia that looks to go back in the same way this kind of return to national cohesion wants to do, and a reflective nostalgia that speaks to that kind of more optimistic notion of nostalgia that I wanted to defend kind of there at the end of my contribution. And Malpas says, well, when we have this return to a fictitious past that is not really ours, and this kind of, uh, the MAGA re rhetoric or this idea that we're gonna go back to the glory of empire that's kind of in the background of, of Tory claims about Britain exiting the EU, would perhaps fall under um, Malpass's recategorization as myth of Philip, because they speak to a past that is not really ours. It's not a part of our self-perception because we cannot really remember that particular period. Uh, and so it's not a way in which we index our, collect our individual identity against a collective identity or culture mm -hmm. of which we have been a part in the past. Um, so in a sense, we, we kind of apportion those things as nostalgia uh, because partly we want to domesticate them, but it's just a part of sentiment. And so we can remove them from that realm. Um, whereas if we, understand them as being truly mythophilic perhaps we see them as being more dangerous and more fictitious than they really are um, and then we would see that there's a lack of truth there in those accounts also. 
Um, that's interesting. And of course, in the case of the Blitz rhetoric, I mean, this is being addressed to a country where most of the residents did not live through the time of the Blitz. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. There's a, an interesting question from Sarah Hoover. Uh, I want, and this is uh, something I think for, yeah, it's for both uh, Nick and Heike. To pick up on what both Nick um, is saying there and what Heike said earlier, can you speak to how uncertainty is expressed in public discourse? Thinking about the way uncertainty is full of effective bloom, graphics tend to concretize statistics without necessarily showing levels of uncertainty and how uncertainty is related to trust. Yeah, I can see how that speaks in interesting different ways to the points that, 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 that you and Nick, uh, uh, Heike, you and Nick were, were talking about. Maybe Heike, first, if you would, if you would come to that question um, about how uncertainty is expressed. Um. Yeah, but not so much how uncertainty is expressed. So maybe just going back to how we as beings with our particular cognitive setup deal with uncertainty. We're not good with uncertainty at all. Cognitively, all the research in cognitive psychology shows how terrible people are thinking with uh, probability and um, that we tend to cognitively go for heuristics rather than actual careful <laughs> reasoning. And um, so it is a particularly cognitive burden on us to actually engage, um, engage carefully with questions of uncertainty, with questions of probability. And that's quite demanding and we're very bad at it. So people get confused. So I, I mean, that's, that's psychology, that's not really philosophy. <laughs> so, but I think what that brings up in, in relation to the, the, the theme of trust is that in the face in particular of kinds of confusion, you can, you can get the effectively driven move into either yeah, a flight forward into trust or, um, yeah, or into resistance. I think some other question there was was um, looking at resistance, and just so as a response to the the feeling of uncertainty and being lost and not quite knowing how to actually grapple with this situation, that it's firmer to either move into I'm being cared for by the experts, mm -hmm. or into the resistance of the let's say more uh, paternalistic uh, resistance, the more teenage attitude yeah. towards um, towards what are you telling me that um, that is actually true when maybe it isn't because, as Nick was highlighting, when you're looking at at the different elements of probabilistic. Um, uh, forecasts, you, it's very easy to leave out the important bits, the conditionals, the, um, yeah, all those differentiations that, um, yeah, that make it easy to fuel the resistance that you may feel. Yeah, do you, do you think enough justice has been done to that, I guess, Nick, is a question for you about, you know, has essentially heightening the awareness of, again, essentially forms of, of probabilistic reasoning and how they're coming into play in decision making. Or is that just maybe asking too much under the circumstances, partly for, for reasons that Heike was indicating there? Yeah, I think it's a very, very good question. Um, just to, to, to start with, what I think the original version of the question was questions about how um, uncertainty or error bars get represented, get, how uncertainty or error bars get represented or fail to get represented um, in government communications or in the media. Um, and that's something that the media does quite badly, even in easy mm -hmm. cases like data on, say, yeah. unemployment levels or worse still, changes in unemployment from month to month. Often the error bars there, which are not hard to calculate in principle, are extremely wide. And often media presentations just ignore them altogether and quote the concrete figures. So the, the, the baseline level of competence there is not, is not high. Um, in the particular case of the COVID crisis, um, I think we have a, a worse situation because that's not an easy case. Often the, um, the sources of uncertainty are complicated and hard to model and there aren't well-established ways for, for putting uncontroversial error bars on the kinds of numbers that get banded about. Um, you might be able to put a fairly clear error bar on um, how many people were admitted to hospital for COVID last week, but you won't be able to put an uncontroversial error bar on the projections 
going forward two or three weeks right. um, because there are so many factors which can be modeled in so many ways and different scientists would disagree over which factors are more important and you'd have error bars and error bars and error bars and error bars and error bars, bars going on ad infinitum and you won't ever crystallize on, a, uh, on an agreed way of expressing the uncertainty. So I, I feel there's no real hope for the media to do a good job of conveying uncertainty in a quantitative or even a very disciplined graphical way in those kinds of cases, simply because the scientists can't really do it either. Um, mm -hmm. But it would be nice if they did a better job of, of, of the easy cases, but one could have said that any time in the last 30 years, really. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a very good point. It's also very helpful. This stuff has been troubling when when the re so many references to following the science as if there was one version of this could, that could be trotted out. On the other hand, and I think this maybe speaks to Heike's point, the public is a little bit intolerant of degrees of uncertainty, and therefore they ask politicians in a way to, to place us on a ground that we feel is a little bit more secure than what they actually maybe are, are able to put us in. Uh, Felix, I had a question for you. Um, it, uh, there was an interesting piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education on Agamben, and, and I, he made some, some pronouncements early on <laughs> that he may now regret, um, but sort of following up on his notion of states of exception and so forth. Um, but at the end of February, he was arguing that this was really the normal flu not not a great thing to be uh, offering, uh, for somebody based in Italy. So, yeah, I, I don't know if you have a specific view on his contribution during the crisis, but I guess it's an interesting case of maybe a theory locking somebody into a, a certain kind of perspective um, at a moment in time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it speaks to distrust, I guess, in terms of uh, Gambon himself in relation to this whole. So, so it, I mean, what's interesting is, I mean, Agamben, I mean, the side of Agamben I didn't talk about was what he takes from uh, from Foucault, the notion of biopower, you know, so, so the idea that no. uh, sovereignty is about a bare life um, and, 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 and is a, is, is a reduced sovereignty in the modern world has become more and more about, so to speak, um, uh, diminishing uh, human life to, to, its, to its bare survival, right? And, and, and so it becomes a matter of control over the, the, um, the, the living or dying of, 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 of human beings. And so, so in that sense, it was, it was, I think, a particularly suggestive situation for him, right? Because here we have a situation where all, all modes of political uh, free discourse are being uh, uh, put aside or being, uh, you, you know, are being, being, being um, uh, enclosed in a, in a, in a kind of, uh, in, 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 in put in abstraction uh, while we deal with, you know, uh, matters of life and death, matters of survival. Um, and so I think his, his, where this came from in him was this suspicion uh, that um, this uh, the, the, the way in which this virus was being dealt with uh, was part and parcel of what he sees as this reduction of political discourse to a matter of mere survival. Um, having said all of that, I mean clearly he was wrong, right? I mean clearly it was it was it was a miss uh, it was a mistake it was more than a misstatement and and he repeated it, which makes it worse, yeah. right? And um, and so. Um, uh, yeah, and mm -hmm. philosophers as well can get um, can get um, stuck in their ways, I guess, or stuck in their ways of thinking. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. uh, I'm conscious of the time, but there are a couple of other questions I'd like to come to that have have, have come through, um, and just one is a comment that I'll I'll I'll, I'll offer from me in, in Monday, our colleague, um, is the point that both words and visualizations are performative in different ways. And that what is needed is it is an, is an education in this, so that pub the public ceases to be under the spell of constative fantasy. Um, I think we could have take that as a comment, a very interesting one. Mm. Of questions to to think about. Would uh, any of the speakers from John Rowe? Would any of the speakers like to offer some thoughts in the context of the themes focused upon in relation to what we we now encounter as a fear of the other? Um, I think that had, that did come up in different ways. Certainly, was something that you had touched on, Felix. But I, I don't know if 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 the fear of the other is that um, a helpful and necessary um, way of framing in the current moment. 
I, 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 I think so. I mean, I think it, 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 it's certainly, certainly in play there. Um, um, and, and, a, and, a, and a kind of an scapegoating of the other as well. I mean, uh, we, we, we see this um, in, 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 in different societies. We've seen it in the, in the United States in terms of the African-American community. Um, and, um, and so, um, I mean, uh, there, there is a natural, there, there is a, a common kind of uh, reflex here, which I think is, is made more pronounced by the very notion of contagion itself. Right? I mean, because it, 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 it's the sense where Every every other can be a dangerous other, you know. If I if we think in Schmittian terms, every past friend can now be an enemy, right? I mean, we 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 we're the the, the circle of friends have become the circle of your home, um, and every other home is a potential yeah. source of infection, a potential source of of danger, potential source of death. And yeah. um, so the 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 um, the potential there. Of um, of that that becoming, I mean, the, the way the, the way of thinking that that sets up is one which uh, is rooted in a dichotomy. It seems to me of of same and other uh, mm -hmm. right from the beginning. Right mm -hmm. now, that that's not to say, and I think we've seen that in in Ireland uh, for the most part uh, 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 quite well. That that can go hand in hand with a sense of solidarity. That can be, so to speak, it, it can be countered by a sense of solidarity uh, with those who uh, who are other. Um, but it, you know, uh, members of the Chinese community, for example, in Ireland, have experienced uh, the uh, um, um, uh, scapegoating in relation to this. So I mean, it's, it's it's something which I think is is inherent in the in the situation. Yeah, and it's so widespread. And it's happening in China. It's obviously happening in so many different places with different sort of modalities, and uh, that that it does suggest a, a common theme. There's a question um, uh, uh, for Heike from Karen Fletcher from TU Dublin. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand it, but I'll offer it to you. It, it appears that those structural and relational elements that you were highlighting should not be underestimated. Do you feel where attention on either? or the environment, people, or outcome determines the decision, or is it just an aggregation of all the elements? It's rather complicated. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure I totally understand that, but uh, Heike, do you have a, uh, have a way of parsing that, that question? You're, you're, you're muted there, Heike, so. Maybe I'm not doing justice to the question. Um, <laughs> so for me, what that highlights is, is yeah, is, is the question, how significant are those particular relational elements? And um, is there any particular one that is particularly important? So I'm not entirely sure. Um, so one thing I think is particularly significant, um, there are all the background structural factors that, if that fuel how we as individuals perceive our own positionality towards, let's say, those who we rely on. But I think to understand how, if we think about trust at least, um, to understand what is going on, I think it's, it is it is very much a relational um, uh, issue. So even though the relational issue is fueled by the environment we live in, etc., in order to understand where it's coming from, I think we, we need to look at that particular relation of people in their perception of what the other is towards them. Yeah. Well, that's very helpful. Yeah, that actually helps me understand the question, which was rather complex and, and tightly packed. Uh, one final question we might uh, might look at. I think this is it for, for, for all of you. Um, and this is from Rachel Noholi. Um, she says, I'm wondering, is there a philosophical concept that deals with the point at which public fatigue sets in and compliance begins to fail and turn into resistance? Um, yeah. I mean, that must be on the minds of lots of people and not just philosophers. Um, so I don't know if, if any of you particularly wanted to uh, have a go at that, uh, at that pivot point where compliance turns into resistance. You know, it's a challenging notion. Felix, do you, uh, are you gonna have a go there? I feel there must be a French word for this, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> Well, maybe a long German one. 
it's, it's, it is, it is fascinating. And I think it's, of course, it's been distributed differently. Enforcement has been distributed very differently in different parts of the country, just speaking from an Irish point of view. I mean, myself, I, I, I only witnessed uh, the guards sort of talking to, you know, a couple of people in a park early on and haven't seen anything since then. I believe there may have been more um, in Dublin and where obviously there were higher numbers of infections and, and greater fear of, um, uh, of the infection rate than escalating as a result. Um, at the moment, I think that part of the challenge presumably is the fact that the places are coming out of this containment at different, in, in, in different times and that exerts a different sort of pressure. Um, and there's the awful American case. Uh, sorry, I'm answering this person's question rather than <laughs> I can't we'll talk to do it properly. But the American case where is probably Trump is the classic example of his own regulations militated against those protesters in Michigan who were on the state the state house steps, and yet he was encouraging them at the same time. So there was a sort of deep incoherence. I apologize for going on, but it's such a, it's such a fascinating panel and the whole territory that you've brought us on to. I have so many more questions and thoughts and things that I would love to have asked you about, but I'm conscious of time, so maybe we should, should, should wrap up there. Thank you again, uh, all of you, for offering such important and interesting and necessary ways of navigating through a, a really philosophically challenging moment and one that I think will renew itself in different ways um, over time. So thank you again. <laughs>